For the best gameplay capture there is, pick up an Elgato today. Links are in the description. Hey guys, how's it going? Master Bucks here. Welcome to another episode of the AFC Women in Career Mode. We are about nearly done, I would say, with the January transfer window. We are wrapping it up at the end of this episode. As far as transfers themselves go, I think we've still got maybe two or three left in us. Maybe a few more transfers away from the club, but no massive signings, I would imagine. I thought this window was going to be relatively quiet and it turned into anything but. We got some games to play in this episode, plus on top of all the transfer business that we have to get through. The first game will be against Fulham. We will play that. They had a pretty decent game against the... Uh, Spurs in the FA Cup. As soon as we get that done, it's nothing but transfers and we can just see out the transfer window. So we will get this game against Fulham out of the way super quickly. We're trying to get the top spot back in the championship. We were miles ahead at the start of the season and recently we've been dropping an unfortunate amount of points. A lot of sim games as well have been very unkind to me. I've been dropping points like crazy in sim games. So hopefully that might turn around for us as well. But still, this game, get it out of the way and then really get to focus on transfers. Come on. We have a player debut, of course. I forgot about Joe Bryan as well. A left back that I've traded for Sean Kelly, plus a little bit of extra cash. But trust me, even though Sean Kelly was pretty decent for us and he was one of the original Wimbledon players, this guy, his stats are unbelievable for a 74-rated player. He can even play in midfield as well, like center defensive mid, center mid, and I'm sure that we will see him play there. Hell, even left midfield, I'm sure he could. He's just so versatile, and I can't wait to see what he's made of. Oh, awkward, awkward moment for them. Is this how we... No, wrong player. It's picked the wrong player out. You're kidding me. It could be 1-0 right there, but it's passed to the wrong player. Mastor, that's a decent turn. Oh, wrong player again. It's fucking killing me at the moment. I'm not getting any opportunities to shoot because I can't get the right pass. That's a solid ball up the middle. Oh, good save, but Cooper, look. It's gone right into the path of Scott Malone there. Left back, he just runs all the way up forward. That is their first shot of the fucking game, I guarantee you. First shot, forces a save, put back into the path of Malone. I'm not even bitching here. Like, that's an amazing ball through. Look, he had to thread the needle past four players, and Cooper, maybe on the rebound, should have done better here. Second half starting up, we had just an extraordinary amount of possession in that first half and just have not been able to find that chance to shoot. They really do park themselves back. I might give them a little bit more of the ball in the second half, maybe try to get some of their numbers up so it's a little easier for me to attack. Scale and you weak cunt! Fuck off! Now look what's going to happen. Fernandez, Junior Fernandez, I'm trying to stay in front shot. Ooh, side netting, and that was right up there. Fucking Josh Gowan, he nearly lost us this game, or it would have been extremely hard to come back from with that weak challenge, and again, a poor pass, and I'm just, it's just awful. This game's given me very little to work with at the moment. Oh, that's not bad. That's not bad. Oh! Okay, I finally, finally, finally had the opportunity to score and to win the game, and what happens? I put the weakest amount of power on it that you would ever imagine. Great. Nice. Awesome. All right. Well, now the fact that I'm not getting anything from this game, it's completely fucking my fault. Or maybe not. Or maybe not. Redemption. Redemption! That still was a shit finish, but it still works and it gets underneath the... It somehow gets underneath the keeper. Lacazette redeems himself. A lot more power on that shot, only right at the keeper. Somehow it got by him. Okay, we find the equalizer. We're at least getting a point so long as we don't stuff up and maybe more. And maybe more. Dazelle just... Alright, no, someone's right there. He can't get the possession. And that will do it full time. Had one chance to score a winner there, but as soon as I go to pass it back, I'm just... I'm surrounded by Fulham players with no one to pass to at all. The whole game they defended so unfucking believably well. I only got two chances really for the whole game to score. One I fucked up right toward the end, and then thankfully, immediately after that, I got another chance with Lacazette and scored that one. So we get one point. Less than we fucking deserve from that game, honestly. Fulham was so good and so, so fucking decent, honestly. I think, whatever. We're lucky to take a point, so I'm not complaining. Now, this is pretty interesting, okay? The highest rated player on my team is Archie Mason, who came on as a sub. He provided the assist to Lacazette, who was the goal scorer, who also came on as a sub, very, like, incredibly. So the, the goal scorer and the assister both came on as subs, like, with... F all time left to go in the game. So Mason really didn't pop up that much. Neither did Lacazette. So I feel like it'd be a little bit ridiculous to give either of the man of the match. I know, but moving on though, still, we have other highly rated players like Kelly Evans and 8.1. I thought he was pretty good today and I might consider him getting man of the match. But the other one, and I bet you'll never guess who, but it's actually Jake Reeves. He got a seven, but he was so, so involved in the play. He made so many passes and really did so much. But I think in the end, a 7 rating, obviously I've missed something, and I think Kelly Evans with the 8.1 will probably pick up this man of the match, so there we go. 
All right, we're back in the swing of things. My goodness, it has been a long time since I last jumped into this FIFA 17 career mode. And I don't know if I, I it's going to sound like an excuse. I know it will, but I have not been playing a lot of FIFA 17 recently. Hell, I've actually been playing a shitload of FIFA 18. Because I've been away, like Gamescom, playing a bunch of FIFA 18. And even though we make our jokes about, oh, it's the exact same game, no. The gameplay is so different, and it was just a bit of a shock jumping back into it. Like, I'm not trying to brag or anything, but I genuinely had troubles adapting back to FIFA 17 after playing so much FIFA 18. Moving on, though, we'll get into the next emails, and of course, all the transfers. First up, we have a transfer offer for a Gold Cooper I want to loan away, so we'll get to that very soon. Peterborough want $5 million for Leandro de Silva Lopez, who I'm still going back and forth with. And then Bobby Reid accepting his pre-contract offer. This is another guy like low 70s, but a nice central midfielder with super well-rounded stats. Kind of like Joe Bryan. As a matter of fact, they're both coming from Bristol City. So yeah, we are accepting this man. And again, just going to pay his wages. He'll hopefully grow a little higher. He's not super old or anything. And he could maybe be a decent backup player for us a little later on. And Peterborough, well, let's just slowly bump this up because we've got plenty of time left and I'm in no rush. Three million. And now we've got an entire week left until our next game, which again, we will be playing. It's Spurs in the FA Cup. We definitely want to play that game. We've sold Paul Robinson too, by the way, who is one of the players that we just wanted to get off the books, one of the older players that would have retired and plus he was taking up a wage, may as well let him go. And we've sold him for 10 grand. We get $6,000 added to our transfer budget just for selling Paul Robinson. That is so crazy. Why did we even bother asking for a transfer fee? Still advancing on forward. We're getting closer. RB Leipzig are going to not accept, unfortunately, our offer for... Oberlin, because apparently another team's gone in for him. I don't know if that means we just can't get him at all anymore, but Spurs have accepted a transfer offer. There are two more strikers that I went for, just super low-rated younger players that are in the last year of their contract that I just threw in whatever offers for, and they've both been accepted. Spurs for uh, Harrison, and then Stoke City for Ngoy. I could straight up get both players, but the thing is, because they're from Premier League teams, I think their wages are going to be a little bit more, so I don't want to completely just burn a bunch of wage on you know, average-ish players. That's why I'm only going to pick between one of these two, and it's going to be Ngoy because he is the higher-rated player, and we're actually getting, like, better value for money. He's almost about the same overall as Oberlin as well, and we were going to have to pay way more for him too, so I think this is fine. I'm happy with doing this, and we're actually going to give him a pay cut to join Wimbledon. Hopefully that all works out fine, and submit the offer. That's all done. Are we going to get it finally? Peterborough, just say yes, and Ngoy, just say yes. I want two accepts. I do not get them. Peterborough are still being fucking assholes about this whole thing. And the contract offer, thankfully though, from Julian Ngoy has been accepted. And Peterborough, if you don't accept 4 million, if you can't work with me here, then I might not even bother throwing in another offer out of fucking spite. We'll probably go for somebody else. I know that I probably could do better, but I'm happy with Leandro de Silva Lopez, even, even still. It's just because of the fact that we don't have much time to scout really any other players further, so I'm happy with him. And finally, they've thrown us a bone. 4 million for Leandro de Silva Lopez. We have the cash and we are going to sign it. And look, wow, Doncaster have actually accepted the 300 grand for Chris Robertson, a 30, 31, 32 uh, year old center back, uh, way over his value. But you know what? Fine, we'll take it. And look at the wage comparison between a lower rated striker from a Premier League side to an actual decent Peterborough player. And his wage is just so much cheaper. But either way, five years, again, no squad role if we don't need. Send it away. We should hopefully have both of these players signed before this game. Hell, De Silva Lopez might be able to play against Spurs if we get this done immediately. And he will. Beautiful result. Welcome into the team, son, finally. After a fair bit of back and forth, he is in the team. So guys, we are pretty much done with transfers. Like, I would be perfectly fine with just putting them down and not doing any more transfer-related business for the rest of the window. The fact is, though, we still have five to six to seven million dollars worth of budget left. And the fact is, I really do want to spend all of it every single season because it just replenishes at the beginning of the new season. So... If there's any players that I could get on pre-contract that are still in the shortlist, hell, there's some players that are 22 that I actually think turn 23 a little later on in January, like right toward the end. I might even go for them on pre-contract potentially, or maybe I could just buy in better scouts. Who knows? Let's do it then. Spurs versus Wimbledon in the FA Cup then. Let's just go. This is probably going to be one of the bigger tests that we've had. I mean... On paper, Manchester City are probably the better side that we have had to face if you just want to take all the opponents that we've come across, and they knocked us out. So now we have to go to White Hart Lane against Spurs. I'm not so sure of our chances, but we're going to put in as big an effort as possible. We have De Silva Lopez in the side, and pretty much that is the strongest starting lemon that we have out there. So I'm feeling confident. 
Ish. I don't know. Didn't put in the better performances against Fulham. So now I've got to try to step my game up against Spurs. Let's go. So every single game that we have played in this episode, we have had a debutante appearance. So the first one was Joe Bryan, and now it is Leandro De Silva Lopez. And maybe potentially Ngoy off of the bench as well. I reckon depending on how well Ivan goes, maybe he gets tired, maybe he's not doing the business, there's a good chance that you could see him in. And looking at the Tottenham Hotspur side, it's probably not their better team, but I can see some of the dangerous players in their side out there. That said, they're missing quite a few. You've got Ericsson, you've got Kane, although that, to be said, we are a sit where nearly two seasons in here, and I reckon a few of them might have just been sold on. Oh, what a ball. What a ball. Clinton Yee and saved by Harvey Cooper. There we go. He's the real hero of the series. Oh, what a ball. Wow, what a fucking pass. And Suns is running right on through and fires it almost through the keeper. I don't know what Harvey Cooper's doing. I think he's just running right at uh, Hyung Ming Son, not even trying to make a save. Look at this. Bang. Well, by the time the ball got past him, he hadn't even tried to make the save, so there was no chance. Yes, nice. That couldn't have gone any better. Maybe a goal on debut. De Silva. Header. Ivan. Oh, what a nice goal that one was. Saved or blocked, should I say, the first initial effort by Leandro De Silva Lopez. But the ball bounces into the path of, I can't exactly remember who, but headed it down perfectly for Andre Ivan, who puts us level. Nice then. It's level. 1-1, one, one, and let's get back into the swing of things. Oh, I'm not liking the chances. Ivan does get past. Numbers here, though, if we can work this well. Oh, yes, son. We could not have worked that any better. Oh, saved by Michelle Vaughan last second. Nice. Ivan's not exactly through. Oh, he's just skinned him. Skinned him beautifully. Mastor. 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 2-1. There we go. Ivan beat his man. He's having a hell of a day today. And Mastor provided the assist last time. The roles are reversed now. Could this end up being our first big Premier League scout? Look, the ball, it was just good enough. And the f oh, it was hit with power, hit low and hard, and just got by Michel Vaughan before he could get a hand to it. Look, great tackle again, Lacazette. He's just right on the pitch, making all the tackles. Can't get the possession that time, but have to credit him. He's done brilliantly so far. Lacazette again. Amazing work. And look at this. This could be the game. It could be if we can work it out nicely. Dizelle. A little pass there. Is he onside? Still no. Can't find a way around. Dizelle though. Bang. Strike. It's... How has that got in? No idea. Must have been deflected. But Dizelle. It finds its way in the net. And that could be that. I thought Andre Dizelle was going to power that into the top right hand corner. And in the end, a lot of power was put on the shot. But he just sort of finessed it in. What a pass. Jan Vertonghen. Oh, put wide. I don't know why I'm panicking so much. I mean, if they score, yeah, sure. We're still in the lead, though. There it is. There it is, Ryan Kent. Oh, I think Ngoy's just gone offside there a little bit. No. He scores. Oh, no, it is. It is a goal on his debut right off of the bench. I thought he was offside. And even the, the Nunu boy, the debutant, not Leandro De Silva, not the man that's given him a hug from behind. He played the full 90 minutes, couldn't score. And Ngoy right off of the bench, his first shot for Wimbledon, his first touch of the ball. It's a goal. This must have been close. Ryan Kent's done brilliantly to win the ball back. And Ngoy finishes... And I thought so much it was going to end up being offside. But nah, it's 4-1 against Tottenham. Welcome to AFC Wimbledon, Julian Ngoy. Absolutely ridiculous scenes. And surely that has to be that. There can't be that much stoppage time left. Jansen actually wins the header. Kelly Evans has turned it over. Oh my god, they've got two. What is this game? It's unbelievable. Unreal. That's that's like some FIFA 18 kickoff shit. He just whacked it upfield and they scored. All right, well, unfortunate. We're not going to win 1-4. We are going to take the win still. There's no way. Finally, we were never going to get a chance to attack. But 2-4. That's the final score. The man of the match in this game was actually given by FIFA to Hachi Mastor with a 9.6. He scored a goal and an assist and was sensational. I have to give it to him. A lot of other very good players today, like Ryan Kent and uh, some others as well. But really, in the end, I have got to give it to Andre Ivan, who got not the man of the match. He didn't get 9.6. He still got 9.5. I did substitute him off. He actually scored a goal and picked up two assists. Unreal game today. And yeah, he probably would have scored another one had I not subbed him off with Ingoy. So he will get man of the match. It's crazy, you know. I had so much trouble trying to beat... Fulham. I couldn't get chances to score against bloody Fulham. But then I come up against the super Premier League side in Tottenham, okay? A real quality team, not playing their best side by all means, but it's the way that they play. They don't sit back. They don't try to just 
you know, they, they really go for it. They put you under the pump, put you under the pressure, commit forward, really try to score. And it's against that sort of play style where I actually do better. So even though Fulham are clearly not as good a team as Tottenham, I do so much better against Tottenham than I do Fulham. It's crazy. It makes sense, but it is still crazy. I think I will make a couple more pre-contract signings in uh, on like literally deadline day because... Seriously, I've got the cash. I may as well use it. I'm trying to get a sale for David Fitzpatrick that's something close to his value. It's not happening, so we'll just sell him on for, you know, just a little under a quarter of a mil. Transfer offer for Chris Weltdale. Another player that's not really getting much action at the moment. 31 years of age. And Portsmouth want to get him for, again, I'm going to counter offer and I don't know why. It's for so little cash compared to the 7.5 mil that we have. But whatever, counter offer, try to get something for what he's actually worth. And again, sim games have been very cruel to me. I know I'm playing a team away, but Nottingham Forest are not that great. Look, they've lost all three of their most recent games. We're skipping ahead. We get the win. There's a red card, not to one of our players, but it's just the one to win. Ryan Kent picks up as the only goal. Beautiful then. Okay, now we are in deadline day. I'm just going to advance ahead. If we have any offers, we will see. And of course, there are still some plays that I might grab on pre-contracts. One play that I've noticed has actually only just turned 23 within the last couple of days is Mark Oliver Kempf. He's 76 rated, 23 years of age. He literally only just turned 23. And I can get him on a pre-contract. Wage is only 15 grand. That's less than half of what we're playing, Julian and Goy. But to be fair, he's good for a goal a game. So maybe the wage is justified. Another player that just turned 23 is Marcos Lorente. Now... This player would be unreal if we could get him from Real Madrid to bloody uh, Wimbledon. But this is the thing. His wage is just so crazy. Understandable considering that he's at Real Madrid. And as quality of signing as he would be in that holding defensive midfield position, I'm just, I'm not going to go for it. And the other player will be Diego Roland. Another player, he's actually 24 though. He's now 80 rated and I'm seeing the stats and I'm seeing so many just lovely light and dark greens just filling all the positions really preserved physical mental technical everything i really want to get this man in as well and his wage only 60 grand i think i'm going to probably take that you know we have already brought in another nice striker in a car but imagine these two if we were to change up formation going alongside each other a car obviously a little taller of a player knocking him down for roland i think that'd be a deadly partnership if we decide to swap it up but still two quality strikers why not get him in so for only 15 grand, this man's going to be joining us next season. And I think Roland is, or Roland, whatever it is, he's only 60 grand worth. $18 million worth of value worth of a player that we're getting into the team as well. So if we don't really want to play him that much, if we want to sell him on, do whatever, it's just a great investment. I might go in for a few more of these players too, by the way. I really want to just increase the depth of my reserves as well. So players like this, for example, Liam Rose, he's an A-League player. He's only worth like just around about a million dollars or so. But the thing is, he's in the last year of his contract. I could get him for so cheap, like dirt, dirt cheap, kind of like what I did with Julian and Goy. If I can get a whole bunch of like mid to high 60s or even 70 odd rated players that are in the last year of their contract, just super, super young, and I could get for super cheap, I just want to buy as many of those players as possible as well. So... We'll see if we can pick a few more of those out as well. All right then, speaking of those kinds of plays, I just went and found a whole bunch of them that were in my shortlist and I'm not sure how much luck we've had. Liam Rose, they've declined again. Leandro Suarez is a pretty decent center attacker midfielder that we've gone for. Munch and Gladbach have accepted 400 grand for a play called Marvin Schultz, another center back who's only like 67, 68 rated, worth 1.5 mil, and we're getting him for that cheap. It's ridiculous. Udinese too, by the way, another center attack and midfielder that's nicely rated, I'd say mid 70s, 3.8 million is what they want. This play is worth a little over 5 million or maybe even 6 million. Yeah, he's worth exactly 6 million and they want 3.8 for him. This is the madness that you can do. The midway point here is about 2.7 million. I'm happy to just bump this up to 3 million straight up. That is half of what he is worth and we could get him for it. Let's do it then. Let's see. Are we about to get this man, this Brazilian superstar in for half of his value? He's relatively young too and we might be able to go and grab him. That, that'd just be tremendous. Looks like we're going to have to bump up his uh, wage a little bit, though, in order for it to happen. Let's go with 35, 20%, five years. Fucking, I'm going to chuck in a crucial first team role as well. He bloody is going to get a game every single game. I may have gone a little too far with that. I probably could have got him for less, but then again, I might not. I might still have to keep going. No, I won't. It's going to be fine. Contract offer except Marvin Schultz, we're going to have to do a little bit more for, but that's fine. He's going to sign Lucas Evangelister. Here we go. 75 rated. That doesn't make him the highest rated player in the team, but he's right up there. 
And with time running out, hopefully we can still manage to sign Marvin Schultz really, really quickly. Come on, mate. Just agree to it. Yes, thank you. Bumped it up by five grand the wage, and he will join as well. This is still going to leave us with $3 million worth of transfer budget, but you know what? I'm fine. I'm just going to spend it on getting better scouts in. That's all. That means on deadline day, there was only about a little over a quarter of a billion dollars spent. I know that sounds like a lot, but it isn't really. I've seen a lot more bigger transfer deadline days for sure. The big one, though, Aubameyang to Manchester United. How many unbelievable strikers do they have now already after just two seasons? It's ridiculous. But this then is how the starting 11 looks for the rest of the season. This is my strongest starting 11. Unfortunately, picked up an injury to Dion Kelly Evans, but hopefully that will pass. It's not too long of an injury. Anyway, the back four. Brian, a brand new left back who can play in midfield. Might even look to move him up to a uh, midfield-ish area, depending on how things go at the start of next season. Barber, Metz, who's been okay, but we'll look to improve the centre-back position, get a much higher rated player in. We've already got a bunch of them on pre-contracts coming in. And then the midfield. Brian Kent, De Silva Lopez, the new right midfielder. Evan Gellister at centre attack in midfield and looking great. Scowen and Reeves in midfield position as well. And Ivan up forward just continuing to bang in an extraordinary amount of goals and racking up some decent assists as well. A bunch of new signings, some on pre-contracts and some big plays that we brought in just immediately. That Lucas Evan Gellister. Can't wait to see how he's going to go at centre attack in midfield. Bit of Brazilian flair into the AFC Wimbledon side. But that's going to do it for this episode. Thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And of course, until the next episode, my name is Master Bucks and have a good one.